Hi everyone and welcome to episode 6 of FastLED Basics, in which we're focusing on the noise functions. If you're just beginning with FastLED, definitely start from episode 1 in the playlist or you're going to struggle with this one. The noise functions in FastLED enable the creation of some really interesting effects, however they can be quite difficult to understand. I've decided not to go over the mathematics of generating noise here, as firstly you don't need to understand it in order to use it, secondly other people have covered it much better than I could, uh, and thirdly it's quite complicated. Instead, I'll discuss the various parameters that you can tweak and how to apply them to your LED strips. That being said, some of this is still quite heavy, so if you do have any questions, feel free to add them in the comments. In this episode, we'll be looking at what noise is and why we might want to use it, the iNoise8 function, see what it outputs and how to manipulate it, how to evolve your noise smoothly over time by taking it to the next dimension, and using the fill raw noise and fill noise 16 functions. So let's get started with looking at what noise is. FastLED uses something called Simplex Noise, which is a faster version of Ken Perlin's Perlin Noise. And Perlin only created this algorithm in 2001, making it pretty recent in mathematical terms. I like to think of it as sort of smooth randomness. And to see what I mean by that, let's take a look at these two graphs. So the first graph just plots a thousand random numbers between 0 and 255, and this is known as white noise. Whereas the second plot below contains Simplex Noise. Just by looking at these charts, it should be clear that the bottom one is much more useful for controlling LED strips, as a random pattern jumps horribly from point to point, uh, while noise changes smoothly. The difference is also apparent if you listen to these waveforms. So this is what white noise or random values sounds like. And this is what simplex noise sounds like. You can tell that the second one sounds a lot more natural, something like uh, the noise in an aeroplane cabin or traffic noise from a distance. And once we've created some noise like this, we can apply this output to a parameter on our strips, perhaps hue, brightness, saturation, position, or whatever else you like. And this kind of works in a similar way to the wave functions that are described in episode four. Let's have a look at some code to apply our noise to the hue of uh, the LED strip. So we set up as normal, and then in the loop function, we have our iNoise8 function. Oh, it's iNoise8, it takes one parameter, which is usually called x. Now, I, in this case, I've made the parameter x up of a few different parameters here. I've got i, uh, as we're stepping through the loop, going from one LED to the next. I'm multiplying that by a value called scale, and I'm adding a value called x. What we're then doing is we are writing out to our LED strip, uh, and we're just setting the hue to whatever that noise value returns. Now, in order to show you how these variables affect the output, um, I could plot a million graphs or do a lot of demonstrations, uh, but instead I wanted to create a visualization. Uh, the problem I had was that FastLED code will only run on a microcontroller, and I want to see the results here on the screen. So I wrote a tool in processing. Um, I'd never used processing before or written anything in Java for that matter, but it turned out to be much easier than I expected. On the screen, you can see a graphical representation of the noise data, and below here, you can see what's happening live on the real strip. Uh, while we go through this, you might see some flickering on the strip and on the screen. That's due to the speed at which the serial data can be exchanged from Arduino to processing and back again. Probably not helped by my hacky serial code. Uh, you can see that this lump here on the graph corresponds to that purple lump on the strip. And this trough here corresponds to that cyan color on the strip. So let's start off with the X value. And this determines the starting position of the noise data. And hopefully you can see the effect that this has. Um, as I move this, you can see that we're shifting the noise data from left to right. And that's reflected by what's happening on the strip below. See this trough here corresponds to that yellow trough again that you can see on the strip. So in your code, you could set this up. You could set up the X value to maybe increase or to change every N milliseconds. Uh, and that would make the noise pattern shift like this um, along the strip. Moving on to scale, you can see that adjusting scale, the scale value either stretches out or bunches up the noise. Now, how much, uh, how you set this very much depends on the length of your strip and what effect you're going for. Uh, depending on what else is going on, sometimes I find that adjusting the scale parameter in the program can sometimes look a little bit jumpy. Um, so have a play and see what works for you. As fun as those parameters are, we are missing one big feature and that will quite literally take your noise patterns to the next dimension. Uh, instead of using iNoise8x, we're going to use iNoise8xy instead. But why, you might ask, uh, do we need 2D coordinates when we're only working with a 1D strip? Well, let's have a look at another simulation. What you can see here is not really noise, it's just a bunch of sine waves added together, but it will do as a demonstration. Uh, if I activate the animation here, we can see that our curve sort of smoothly evolves from one form to another. But let's think what's actually happening here. Remember, this is just one dimensional noise going from one side to the other. If I spin the axis round, 
We can see that our noise is actually moving forwards and backwards across the red axis. That would be the Y axis in high noise X comma Y. And so what we've generally done by sending it into the second dimension, we have created a noise landscape. And then by moving our one dimensional noise back and forth through this landscape, that's how we actually evolve it over time. Looking back at our code, I've added T uh, for time as a second parameter to our I noise 8 function. And you can see that it says I noise 8, that's the X part. And then this is now the Y part. Let's go back to our simulation again. And now you can see as well as uh, X and scale like before, we've also got this time parameter. So here's our function I noise 8. Remember this first part is X, the second part is Y. And as we uh, evolve time, as we move time on smoothly, you can see that our noise pattern evolves smoothly as well. I say, please just ignore the flickering there. That's to do with the uh, serial communication. And there's no reason, of course, why we can't set this time to animate. So we could set a time parameter here to the millis function, for example. So increment or increment it every n milliseconds. And when we do that, you can see that uh, the noise pattern evolves nice and smoothly uh, along the strip. Let's take what we've learned here, make a simple animation using iNoise8. Uh, so I've moved my parameters up to the top here. Uh, I'm keeping X as zero the whole time. Uh, for T, I'm using millis divided by five because uh, millis on its own was a little bit too fast. And for scale, I'm going to use beat sign eight uh, to smoothly change from a scale of 10 to a scale of 30 uh, at a period of 10 beats per minute. And you can see that we end up with this interesting pattern. The final thing to mention here is that I've mapped the output of noise uh, from 50 to 190 up to 0 to 255. In general, the results from iNoise 8 tend to hover between 50 and 190. So if you want to see more reds and oranges in your uh, pattern, then we need to widen this out a bit. And that's what I've done there. How about we use noise to recreate a lava effect? Uh, let's build this piece by piece. What I have in my head is an effect that's mainly reds with the occasional bursts of yellow and white. And I also want the brightness of the lava to vary. So let's begin with that. Here I've set up a brightness variable uh, that will use iNoise8. And so we've got brightness scale here. So this, we're scaling it uh, 50 at the moment. And then our time parameter or Y parameter is going to be millis uh, divided by five. So it uh, evolves fairly slowly. Then all I've done is told the LEDs to light up red uh, at full saturation but with the brightness, depending on the brightness reported back by this noise function just here. When I upload that, you can see that I think the scale here is too small. So let's adjust that. Let's increase this to a scale of 150. I want sort of slightly smaller patches of uh, dark and light. And let's upload that. And that looks a lot better. It has the sort of glowing effect uh, that I was after. Now we move on to the hue. So I've copied the lava colors palette uh, from the built-in palettes here, but I've made a couple of changes to it. We've mainly got red, so a tiny bit of orange and white. Now below here, I've set up another noise function. This one I've called uh, index. And we're using index scale, which is currently set to 20. And our Y parameter or T parameter is currently set to millis. Underneath, I'm selecting a color from a palette. We're using lava palette that I defined above. The index into that palette is given by this noise function. And the brightness is given by this noise function just here. OK, a couple of things we need to change here. Firstly, it's running much too fast. Uh, so let's slow it down by dividing millis by 10. And uh, secondly, I think the scale is wrong as well. We're too zoomed in on the noise. I'm looking for little pockets of uh, yellow and red rather than it being spread all over the whole strip. So let's change this to 100 and upload that. And let's see what that looks like. Yeah, this is definitely more what I had in mind. Uh, obviously, we could go back and tweak things further. But that, uh, as all the best textbooks say, is left as an exercise for the reader. The last example we'll look at here is another fiery one based on original code by El Durko. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. El Durko has written a beautiful fire routine. It's actually designed for a 2D matrix of LEDs, but I've just adapted it here to run on a single strip instead. Um, I've also added a bunch of notes to the code here uh, that I made as, as I was figuring out uh, what it's doing, which makes the code look huge. But the original routine is only about two lines long. Uh, the palette I'm using here is heat colors because uh, I thought that looks the best. So we actually begin here uh, with some 3D noise. So you can see here we're using iNoise 8. We've got X, we've got Y, and we've got Z here as well. Uh, the 3D noise here is originally designed for a 2D matrix rather than a 1D strip. That means we were moving through time on the Y and the Z axis. Uh, previously, we saw that using the Y axis was like moving a curve through like a noise landscape. Uh, well, moving through the Z axis is like moving a plane through a noise volume. That doesn't make any sense. Don't worry about it. Just uh, put some numbers in it and see what it looks like.
Then we have this math function here, which basically calculates decreasing values uh, from 255 to zero as I increases from zero to numleds. And then we subtract math uh, from the uh, noise function that we called earlier. Basically, the result of doing this is the further you go along the strip, uh, the more likely you are to get higher values for index. Uh, in this case, the higher index values means more likelihood of getting yellow or white. Uh, so the base of the fire actually ends up at the far end of the strip. I think it's a really lovely effect. Uh, so thank you very much, Eldeco, for making the code available. Another function that I'd like to take a look at is one of the fill functions, uh, which is fill raw noise eight. Uh, we'll start by looking at the code here and you can see that it takes some parameters that we should already be familiar with, including X, scale, time, etc. Uh, it also takes another parameter called octave, uh, which we'll get to shortly. Uh, the major difference between this and iNoise 8 is that it actually fills a, an array with data rather than returning one value at a time. So I've set up an array here to hold that data uh, called noise data. Another important point to remember if you're using this is that it actually adds values to whatever is already in the array. So if you are using this function, you'll need to clear the array uh, each time before calling uh, fill noise raw eight. You can do that with this memset call you can see here where we pass it the array to look at, uh, what to fill it with and the number of items to uh, fill. And in this case, that's gonna be noise data zero and all of them. Uh, then we generate our noise data on this line here and uh, we apply it uh, to our LEDs on this line down here. In this case, I've chosen to use the noise value as the as an index into the party colors palette. Here I've set the index just to be noise data I, and I've set the brightness uh, to be the same noise data, but just starting from the other end of the array instead. Uh, I'm sure we could make something better given a bit of time, but uh, I think you get the idea. Let's bring up our visualizer again and have a play with these options. So here you can see our fill raw noise eight function at the top. We've got our noise data array. How many points of data we want to produce? 56 in this case. Uh, one here is our octave, which we'll talk about in a second. And then we've got zero, which is X, 10, which is scale. And again, zero, which is time, the end just here. So let's have a quick play with the uh, the original parameters here. So again, if we move X, we can see that it moves the noise uh, back and forth along the strip. Uh, if we change scale like earlier, we can see that it makes a uh, bunches up or spreads out the noise again, as we expect. Time again sort of evolves our noise through time. So we can see it changing nice and smoothly there. And of course we can animate that. So let's have a little look at octave. Uh, basically the greater the octave is, the more lumpy the data is. So if I set that to two, you can see we've now got more lumps uh, in that data. What's happening here is more noise data at a higher frequency is being added on top of the noise data that's already there. Uh, the first octave, so octave one, uh, has 100% of its amplitude included. And this is what we see here. Uh, the noise making up the second octave is divided by two and added onto the first one. So noise making up the third octave again is divided by four and then that's added onto whatever's already in the array. The fourth one will be divided by eight, etc. So the amount of noise that each octave contributes decreases each time. The issue with this, as you can clearly see, is that the data very quickly gets saturated as we're adding to the data points in each time. Uh, to avoid this issue, you'd have to divide down uh, the data again after increasing the octave uh, to keep it in range before using it. Uh, but let's see, we'll set that to octave two. Let's animate time. Let's uh, change our X value a little bit here as well. And uh, we can see we get a lovely pretty pattern uh, being produced from that. Quite a nice little effect there. There's another fast lead function that uses uh, fill raw noise in the background, and that's this fill noise 16 function. Uh, I'll show you a quick demo of this here so you can see what it does. Basically, it automatically creates two noise functions, a little like we did with the lava example earlier, uh, one controlling the brightness of the strip and the other controlling the hue. Uh, by now, hopefully most of these parameters will make a bit more sense. Uh, so octaves, X and scale, uh, these apply to the noise controlling the brightness of the strip. And then hue octaves, hue X, hue scale and hue shift, they apply to the uh, noise controlling the hue of the strip. Then we've got time as we had uh, previously. Uh, my The issue I have with this particular function is that you have to use the same time parameter for both the brightness and uh, the hue. And I feel like it kind of unnecessarily limits the flexibility of this function a little bit. For the final example, I'm gonna make a pattern that has a dim plasma-like effect in the background with an LED that moves up and down the strip according to the noise function uh, and leaving a trail behind it. This will also show you how to blend together two different patterns. You can see that I've set up two CRGB arrays this time, uh, one for the background and one for the LEDs output array. Now in my loop here, I draw the background first. So let's have a quick look at that. It's nice and simple. I'm just using that fill noise 16 uh, command that we saw earlier. 
and it just fills the strip with a, a sort of colorful plasma. You can see, play about with the parameters of this, see what you can create. Then I call a uh, draw moving pixel. And this uses iNoise 16 uh, instead of iNoise 8 to create a position that changes over time. Uh, I'm using iNoise 16 here instead of 8 to preserve some resolution uh, if this was used on a longer strip. Now this will return a 16-bit number, uh, so something from 0 to 65535. Now we remember with iNoise 8, the results seem to fluctuate between about 50 and about 190. Well, with iNoise 16, the results seem to fluctuate between around 13,000 and about 51,000. Now, because I'm using the output of this as a position, I have to be careful here not to write outside of the LED array, so you know below zero or above numleds. So first of all, what I'm doing here is constraining the results, just in case there are a few that are above or below these numbers. I'm constraining the results uh, to be between 13,000 and 51,000. And then I'm mapping that result uh, from zero to numleds minus one. And then finally, I set the LED uh, to red at that position. Going back to the loop again, um, every 20 milliseconds, we then call fade to black by on the LEDs array. And this creates a trail effect behind the moving pixel. And then we blend together uh, the two arrays and output it to LEDs. So we've got LEDs as one array, background as the other one, and we're gonna blend all of those together. That 30 number afterwards is basically specifying how quickly that blend happens. How many times does it have to be called before that blend is complete? Uh, for more information on blending stuff together, uh, have a look at episode five, multiple patterns, because we do talk about it a little bit more there. Looking at the pattern here, you might notice that the pixel uh, sometimes stops for a while in the middle of the strip. Uh, I believe this is actually a bug in FastLED's implementation of noise. I've reported it on GitHub and uh, Mark Kriegsman has acknowledged the issue. So hopefully he or someone else cleverer than me uh, can determine a solution to this. Hacking on this particular bit of code uh, is a little bit beyond my abilities, unfortunately. There is so much more that you can do with uh, noise, but the explanations get longer as the patterns become more complicated. So I think we'll leave it there for now. I hope now you have a slightly better understanding of FastLED's noise functions and feel like you can incorporate them uh, into your own patterns as needed. Uh, you can find a link to GitHub for the code and FastLED's noise functions in the description below. That's all for me for now, and I'll see you next time.